name is Rochelle Ruthchild, and I'm very happy to be moderating the talk today as part of our program that is sponsored by the Gender Socialism and Post-Socialism Workshop of the Davis Center, entitled What Studying Putin's Russia Can Teach Us About the United States, Masculinity, Misogyny, and U.S. Elections in the Trump Era. I think you will find that this is a particularly timely topic. Uh, I'm happy to introduce our speakers for today, um, and we will be they will be discussing their book, Trumping Politics as Usual, Masculinity, Misogyny, and the 2016 Elections. The co-authors of the book are Valerie Sperling, who's a professor of political science at Clark University. Her research lies mainly at the intersection of Russian politics and gender studies. She's the author of Sex, Politics, and Putin, Political Legitimacy in Russia, published in 2015, and the co-author of Courting Gender Justice, Russia, Turkey, and the European Court of Human Rights, which was published in 2019. Sperling's most recent book, again, is the book that she's going to be discussing with her Clark colleague, Rob Boatwright. Robert Boatwright is a professor and chair of the Department of Political Science at Clark University and the director of research for the National Institute for Civil Discourse at the University of Arizona. His research focuses on the effects of campaign and election laws on the behavior of politicians and interest groups. In addition to the book under discussion, he has published Getting Primaried, the Changing Politics of Congressional Primary Challenges, which was published in 2013, and A Crisis of Civility, Political Discourse and Its Discontents, published in 2018. He's co-editor of that book. He's currently completing a book manuscript on how American politicians discuss political corruption. So I am delighted to welcome you to this talk. If you have questions, you can uh, address the questions to the speakers through the YouTube chat box. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rochelle. I'm just gonna go ahead and show our PowerPoint. There you go. Um, so, everybody can hear me? All right, so thank you, Rochelle, and thank you to the other organizers of the Gender and Post-Socialism Workshop here at the Davis Center. Uh, we appreciate your being open-minded and hosting our book talk because it might appear that this book on US elections is just a bit tangential to the usual focus of the series. However, the origin story of this book is actually rooted in the study of gender and post-socialism. Um, as Rochelle said, Rob and I are colleagues at Clark University, and he is an expert on U.S. campaigns and elections, especially primaries. And um, as Rochelle mentioned, I published a book about gender and politics uh, in Russia a few years ago, looking at how masculinity and femininity and homophobia are used as political tools or weapons in the Russian context. So when campaign season began for the 2016 presidential elections in the United States, uh, and Donald Trump declared as one of the candidates, and all these bigoted and sexist things that he had said, started to come out and circulate. Uh, when that happened, Rob and I had uh, what I've come to think of as our Brady Bunch moment, where we decided to bring our respective expertise together and see what would happen if we applied the analysis of gender and politics from sex politics and Putin to the subject of Rob's expertise, the election campaign that was underway in the US. And when you add uh, US campaigns and elections to gender norms and Russian politics, this is the result. So what we're gonna do today is talk about gender and elections, and we're gonna focus on the unusually central role that misogyny and masculinity played in the 2016 elections in the US. We'll say a little about that memorable presidential campaign, uh, but much of what we're interested in is the impact of that presidential race on the congressional races that took place that year. What we argue in a nutshell is that Donald Trump's candidacy in 2016 radically altered the nature of the 2016 congressional campaigns in two important ways that are connected. 
First, Trump's attacks on women from Hillary Clinton and other female politicians to journalists and even private citizens, um, his variety of misogynist pronouncements alienated numerous potential supporters and put Republican candidates running for the House and Senate on the defensive. As you can imagine, because um, you're seeing it again now, every time Trump said something grossly sexist or racist for that matter, Republicans running for office would be asked whether they still supported him. So Trump's misogyny had an impact on what are called down ballot races, meaning campaigns for the House and Senate. The second thing about the presidential race that had an impact on House and Senate candidates in 2016 was that Trump was roundly expected to lose that election uh, for a lot of reasons, from the fact that Hillary Clinton was seen by many as a far more qualified candidate, that her campaign had more money and better organization than Trump's, and that the presidential, um, and that even his own team expected him to lose the presidential election. The fact that he was expected from early on to lose made Republican congressional candidates much less willing than usual to explicitly connect their own race, their own candidacy to the guy at the top of the Republican ticket. Now these two things, uh, Trump's misogyny and the fact that he was expected to lose the election, these things are connected. Um, because Trump was expected to lose in large part because of his misogyny. Believing this, believing that the presidential race was more or less a foregone conclusion, caused both major parties to direct more of their resources toward congressional races and led many Republican candidates, especially women, to try to distance themselves from Trump in their own campaigns. So now that you have the overall sketch of our argument, what we're gonna do in our talk is to say a little about how gender matters in elections more generally, not just in 2016. And then we'll review some of the ways that masculinity and misogyny cropped up in the presidential race that year. We'll give you some more details to flesh out the ways in which the presidential campaign, both Trump's sexism and his status as the expected loser affected the congressional races in 2016. And we'll also look briefly at how gender stereotypes were mobilized in television ads in the dozen, most the dozen most competitive election campaigns for the Senate. We'll conclude by talking about how the 2016 presidential race changed the ways in which House and Senate campaigns were waged in the midterm elections of 2018, and also how the Trump factor is affecting the 2020 elections. And as we go along, we'll bring in some comparisons to the intersection of gender and politics uh, in Russia as well. So the first question is whether gender matters in elections. Um, public opinion surveys in the US show that voters are at least hypothetically perfectly comfortable with the idea of voting for a woman for president. As of 2010, 95% of Americans said they would be willing to do so. Yet as we found out in 2016, the general support for the idea of voting for a female candidate did not translate into overwhelming support for Hillary Clinton as the first female major party presidential nominee, nor did it mean that traditional and sometimes rather vulgar sexist stereotypes disappeared from our political discourse. If anything, they became more prominent in 2016. By way of comparison, Russian voters are fairly comfortable with the idea of a woman becoming president uh, as of February 2016, 20% of Russians said they would definitely not like to see a woman become president in the next 10 or 15 years, with only 12% saying they would definitely like to see that happen. Uh, one woman did run against Putin in 2018 for the presidency, Ksenia Subchak. Her father had been Putin's boss as the former mayor of Leningrad, and Subchak herself is Putin's goddaughter. Beyond that, she had become a reality TV show celebrity and then something of an opposition figure during the Russian election protests in 2011-2012. Subchak was definitely on the receiving end of various sexist insults before and after and during the uh, 2018 campaign. She was frequently labeled a dura or a silly woman, and she was called a crazy bitch uh, and a whore as well, albeit by Russia's loopiest politician, Vladimir Zhirinovsky, uh, during a presidential debate. In the end, in 2018, Subchak came in in fourth place with less than 2% of the vote. So what do we know then about gender and elections? 
Uh, the best and most recent research available on the US shows that all other things being equal, women running for Congress are just as likely to win as men. Um, male candidates are not particularly advantaged over female candidates. Okay, then you might say, why is Congress made up of only 23.7% women instead of 50% women? Um, the answer is mostly that women don't run for national office. The data suggests that when women do run, they do no worse than men. Something else we know is that the sex of the candidate these days isn't important at all to voters' decisions about whom to vote for, at least when compared to political party identification. In other words, party ID is the best predictor of which candidate anybody votes for. And the corollary to that is that people won't vote against their usual party in order to vote for or vote against a woman. In short, most research on the subject suggests that the gender of a particular candidate probably does not matter to voters, except maybe at the highest executive level, the presidency, where A, we have very little data because 2016 was the first time we had a female major party candidate in the US, and B, because we've always had male presidents in the US, it seems probable that voters might expect future presidential candidates to conform to the past model and be men. But even if voters don't usually care much whether a candidate is male or female, people do still generally expect men and women to conform to certain gender stereotypes. Women are generally expected to be nice and polite, uh, likable and pleasing and not abrasive, which is a little challenging in the political context. And men are generally expected to display toughness and decisiveness and firmness and not be too emotional, although for men displaying anger is seen as much more acceptable than women doing so. As we'll see, people's ideas about masculinity and femininity, uh, gender norms, how candidates come across as being properly feminine, but not too weak if they're women, uh, or as being correctly masculine if they're men, those gender norms do matter in the impressions that voters get about candidates. And you see that reflected in campaigns and campaign ads, where displaying proper masculinity in particular plays a big role. Now you can certainly see a lot of masculinity contestation on display in the 2016 presidential election. Um, we're not gonna go back over all that territory today, but just to remind you of the highlights, the Republican presidential primary constituted a particularly graphic masculinity contest. You had Donald Trump calling Florida Senator Marco Rubio, little Marco, suggesting that Rubio was more of a boy than a real man. That was followed by Marco Rubio's insinuation about the size of Trump's genitalia. There was also Trump's successful effort to undermine the campaign of the man who at the time was assumed to be the Republican front runner, Florida Governor Jeb Bush, uh, by calling him low energy Jeb, again, suggesting Bush wasn't a robust, virile man. And Bush's last ditch effort to assert his manliness um, by sending out a one word tweet saying America accompanied by a photo of a handgun with Bush's name engraved on it. You also had Trump at a rally in New Hampshire repeating from the stage a comment by an audience member um, that presidential candidate and Senator Ted Cruz was a pussy. In other words, not a real man because Cruz hadn't wholeheartedly endorsed the torture technique known as waterboarding. Now, just to make a quick comparison to Russia, President Putin, of course, doesn't have to engage in this level of contestation because he has no serious contenders in that system. But displays of masculinity are still an important part of legitimating his political position. I imagine most, if not all of you, have seen the plethora of images of Putin's masculinity on display, whether he's saving a TV camera crew from a Siberian tiger or fighting the fires outside Moscow from a helicopter, or simply being shown as a strong president, as you can see on this billboard for the most recent presidential elections in March 2018. In other words, gender norms matter in Russian politics too, even though there's not the same kind of public competition and contestation in Russian national elections that there is here in the United States. Now to get back to the United States, uh, once the general election got underway in 2016, and the presidential contest was just between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, misogyny came more to the fore and Trump made a point of critiquing Clinton in terms of her femininity. Trump lashed out at Clinton during the final presidential debate, calling her a nasty woman 
uh, when she explained how she had hoped to uh, increase taxes on the wealthy in order to improve the funding for Social Security. And she said, according to her plan, her taxes would go up and so would Trump's if, as she put it, he can't figure out how to get out of it uh, because Trump had refused to release his tax returns. So with this nasty woman moniker, which he applied to many people after that, he was saying that Hillary Clinton was not being a proper woman. She was nasty. Uh, in a typical pattern of sexist discourse, he also insulted Hillary Clinton for her looks, uh, saying about uh, her at an October 2016 rally, when she walked in front of me, believe me, I wasn't impressed. He also repeatedly characterized Clinton as weak, having no stamina, suggesting she wasn't sufficiently strong or tough enough to be president. And one of his final campaign ads titled Dangerous argued that in this dangerous world of war and Islamic jihadists, Hillary Clinton lacked the fortitude to lead the United States. The ad showed her stumbling um, when she had had pneumonia that fall and physically being supported by men who helped her into a car. And it ended by pledging that Donald Trump was the only candidate who could protect the country, playing on that gender stereotypical idea that men protect and women need protection. You could also easily find evidence of misogyny in Trump campaign paraphernalia, like this t-shirt portraying Hillary Clinton, or this button worn by a Trump supporter. Even though ostensibly the American public is prepared to vote for a woman for president, Trump's campaign and his victory suggest that sexist stereotypes still enjoy a lot of support. Um, buttons like this one, um, urging life's a bitch, don't vote for one, sold well at the Republican National Convention in July 2016 in Cleveland. And while the people who bought that button might have argued that they didn't consider themselves sexist, that a woman had every right to run for president, and that they simply hated Hillary Clinton, and not because she was a woman. The fact is, if you look at this image and you think about gender stereotypes, you can see that it's less about Clinton being female than it is about her femininity, her gender, the societal construction of her femaleness. In other words, the people who designed the pin were showing Clinton transgressing the societal rules about proper feminine behavior. Clinton is being shown as the stereotypical quote unquote bitch who is overstepping her bounds, who's talking or shouting as was often said about Clinton too loudly and who keeps her mouth open when people don't wanna hear what she has to say. So misogyny was certainly mobilized in the presidential campaign, but masculinity also continued to be important and even central to the presidential campaign in the way that Trump was portrayed in advertisements by his opponents. Uh, just as there are gender stereotypes about women's acceptable behavior, there are also gender stereotypes about how men are allowed to behave. Now it's true that the norms of masculine behavior overlap more with the expectations of what a president would be like. Um, qualities like rationality, decisiveness, and toughness are identified with masculinity and also with being presidential. But a number of ads, both by Clinton's campaign and by anti-Trump uh, political action committees or PACs, both during and after the primaries, emphasize Trump's behavior as a man and argue that he was not properly enacting masculinity. He was not acting the way that a man should that he had kind of overdone it, that he had crossed the line with his level of disrespect for women and that he therefore was not presidential material. So for example, the anti-Trump super PAC called Our Principles released an ad called Quotes in March of 2016, featuring a diverse group of women taking turns reciting a series of sexist remarks that Trump had made from calling various women who had criticized him a bimbo, a dog and a fat pig to, note, to noting that, quote, a person who is flat chested is very hard to be at 10 and saying, women, you have to treat them like shit. At the time, this ad really seemed to sum up the problem with Trump as a plausible candidate. Trump's opponents also publicly questioned his masculinity during the campaign. On several occasions, Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren led this charge. For instance, in July, 2016, when Trump announced Mike Pence as his running mate, Warren tweeted that Trump and Pence were a perfect match, two small, insecure, weak men who use hate and fear to divide our country and our people. In addition to their smallness and weakness, suggesting a lack of manly qualities, 
Warren's comments subtly, if sarcastically, implied even a romantic connection between the two men, thus playing on homophobia as well. These critiques intensified after the election, especially as the Russian election interference scandal got more attention. You could see many homophobic signs and memes painting Trump as desperately lacking in masculinity, like this um, or this, suggesting that because of that masculinity deficit, he was not worthy of respect um, or of the presidential office. Putin's opponents in Russia have also drawn on homophobia many times implying that he and Medvedev were a couple and have also questioned Putin's masculinity as a way to delegitimate him, such as the Pussy Riot Collective referring to Putin as an effeminate Botox user in one of their songs and as a weak and frightened little quote bitch who panicked when faced with protesters in December 2011 in their song evocatively titled Putin Pissed Himself. So the use of gender norms as weapons in the struggle over political legitimacy is by no means unique to the United States. Now, at the heart of our book is the idea that two things really brought gender issues to the fore in the 2016 elections. First, there was all the misogyny on Trump's part. And second, the fact that you had the first woman running for the presidency at the top of a major party ticket, those two facts combined to make gender issues much more salient than they typically would be. And they also combined to make it appear that Trump was going to lose the election in significant part because he kept saying misogynist things or misogynist things he had said or done in the past kept leaking out and making their rounds. So let's go to the heart of our argument and see what impact the presidential race had on the congressional races. Let me pause for a moment and uh, thank all of you for uh, having us here. Um, I think this is a, a fortuitous time to be giving this talk because uh, circumstances this week, I think uh, in many ways resemble the sorts of things that we're talking about in our book. Uh, given the environment that uh, Valerie has spoken about, uh, what do you do if you're running for Congress? Uh, there was a lot of speculation during the election about the effect that Donald Trump would have on the Republican party. Uh, would Republicans repudiate him or would they try to act like Trump? Ultimately, the question is pretty simple. Uh, most politicians aren't that exciting. Most Republican politicians could not have acted like Trump if they had tried to. So the question then is how somebody runs for office at a time when they know that media accounts of the election are gonna be dominated by a campaign that's far more exciting, far more bizarre and far uglier than what they and their opponents were doing. In our book, we answer this question in three parts uh, by looking at the two, uh, 2016 primary elections, at the 2016 general election for Congress, and by taking a particular look at political advertising in 2016. Let's first uh, take a look at the 2016 congressional primaries. Those of you with uh, good memories or a good command of recent history may recall that the Republican Party was experiencing a lot of internal conflict in the years uh, preceding Donald Trump's nomination. The rise of the Tea Party in 2010 meant that a large number of Republican House and Senate primaries featured candidates with sharp ideological disagreements. In many cases, these primaries pitted quote unquote establishment Republicans, often incumbents, against insurgent candidates running on a platform calling for among other things, a substantial uh, reduction in government spending. Democratic primaries during this period in contrast tended to be pretty dull affairs. And the Democratic party over the past decade or so has done a much better job than the Republican party of getting voters and donors to coalesce behind the party's chosen candidates long before anybody actually votes. Without getting too far into the weeds, let me show you a few graphs that illustrate this pattern. Uh, competition in Republican primaries went pretty far down uh, in 2016. Um, see, Valerie, you're in charge, there we go. Um, uh, the graphs that you see here show what's called a fractionalization index, which is a zero to one measure of election competitiveness. Uh, so you can see that competition went down in Republican primaries compared to Democratic primaries. Uh, but you can also see that competition went down in particular in what are called concurrent primaries. That is congressional primaries that took place on the same day as the uh, presidential primary. Um, there we go, there's that one. A Republican spending in primaries was down also and it went down noticeably again in primaries that took place on the same day as the state's presidential primary. 
So you see that right there. Uh, so what these graphs tell us, I think, is this. Uh, to run for Congress, you have to put together a campaign organization many months before the actual election. So it's not as if any of the people who chose to run in 2016 anticipated that Donald Trump would be the Republican nominee. These are normal candidates, uh, conventional Republican candidates, who had reason to think that 2016 might be a reasonably good year, or at least as good a year as 2014 had been. These people get into the race, and then it turns out that they can't get any attention at all. Everyone is riveted by the drama of the presidential race, and they have no ability to get anyone's attention. One other thing we did was to look for candidates who seemed to be emulating Trump. We looked at all of the media stories we could get our hands on for comparisons between House and Senate primaries and Donald Trump. We actually didn't find many, and we were unimpressed by the ones that we, that we did find. There was a lot of media speculation in 2016 about what were called uh, mini Trumps. But what we actually found were a couple types of candidates. There were some Republican candidates who are likely losers who seemed to have hitched their wagon to Trump because it gave them a little bit of extra attention. Uh, the smattering of candidates who endorsed Trump during the primary were of this sort. Second, there were some candidates who had done something obnoxious in the past, right? At one point in the past five years, the past 10 years, whatever, they had said something kind of crude and therefore they got lumped in with Trump uh, for that reason. Uh, for instance, Jason Lewis, a Minnesota talk show host, had said some kind of misogynistic things during his career on the radio. Lewis refused to disavow these statements during his campaign but interestingly, he discovered fairly quickly that he couldn't go on talking like that. And he actually went out of his way to avoid uh, using misogynistic insults against his female opponents in the primary and in the general election. And he refused to say whether he supported Trump uh, during his campaign. He won a House seat in 2016, but got clobbered in his reelection bid in uh, 2018, perhaps because people continue to have this sort of mini Trump frame and thinking about it. The main effect of the presidential race on the congressional primaries then seemed to be that the Republican presidential primary so dominated the attention of the media and the public that conservative Tea Party candidates who might otherwise uh, have seemed interesting, right, and might have done well because of their uh, the novelty, uh, were unable to get public attention or raise the kind of money that they were used to raising. It was as if the presidential primary had sucked all of the air out of the room. You'll see references even today to the decline of the Tea Party in a variety of places, but one contention that you don't see, which I think is actually true, is that the Tea Party didn't die of natural causes. Donald Trump's campaign killed it. The candidates who did succeed in their primaries, however, chose largely to ignore Trump. There wasn't much reason to expect him to win the nomination, and even when it became apparent that he would, there wasn't much uh, reason to expect him to win the general election. It was safest for most Republicans to ignore him, and in particular, to avoid rhetoric that would make voters think that you resembled him. He looked like a loser, and he looked like a loser because of the way that he talked. So this is where things stand by the end of the primaries. Republicans have nominated a loser, and both, candidate, both parties' candidates have to plan accordingly. This isn't actually the first time that this has happened. Uh, many of you are likely too young to remember this, but it was the norm in uh, the 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s for presidential election outcomes to be rather lopsided. The last few candidates who seemed fated to lose, uh, John McCain in 2008, Bob Dole in 1996, or Walter Mondale, George McGovern, and Barry Goldwater, if you go further back, all ran campaigns that were aimed in part at minimizing the damage that they did, that they did to the other candidates on the ballot, and to try to build up the party for the future. That is, these candidates ran as if they knew they were going to lose. Donald Trump didn't do this. He didn't campaign like a loser. And perhaps, again, given the ultimate outcome of the election, this was a wise decision. But it was the decision that caused problems for many of the other candidates on the ballot. Just as was the case in the primaries, both parties' candidates had to figure out how to campaign when unusual things were likely to emerge every day from the presidential election. Republican candidates in particular were regularly forced to respond to provocative or offensive things that Trump had said. Now we'll see uh, what this means for some individual candidates in a moment, but let's first take a look at the bigger picture. You may have been puzzled by some of what I just said about Trump being a loser. After all, he did wind up winning, and you, like me, may know plenty of people who spent most of the, much of the fall convinced that regardless of what the polls said, he was going to win. 
So let me show you a couple of pieces of what I see as conclusive evidence that the people who matter here, the other candidates for office, the leaders of the two parties, and perhaps most consequentially, the people who give money to the two parties and their allied super PACs thought that Trump was going to lose. The first bit of evidence is here. At the top here, you see the polling averages throughout the campaign. Trump is running consistently behind Clinton, according to the poll aggregators, for the first month or so after the two parties' uh, conventions. There aren't any polls that show him ahead. Uh, but by the, first week, by the first week of October, the bottom completely drops out. That's the part that I've got uh, circled there. Trump's support plummets all at once. And when it plummets, you see this massive shift of money uh, into Republican Senate campaigns. Uh, the graph there at the bottom shows weekly independent expenditure totals, or if you prefer, super PAC uh, spending totals. The spending decisions then of people making large unregulated contributions to groups that would spend on behalf of candidates. So Trump support tanks and the Republican big spenders give up on him and decide that it's time to save the Senate to inoculate Republican Senate candidates against Trump. You see this change here as well. Uh, there we go. Um, <clears throat> Um, this is independent spending in the presidential race. Uh, Trump falls way, way behind during that first week in October. So what happened here? Well, this was, you may remember, the week of the Pussygate uh, scandal, uh, the week in which the Access Hollywood tape was released, in which Trump is caught on tape saying, and I quote, when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Grab them by the pussy. You can do anything. So Republicans are at this point in a position that we've come to know all too well uh, since 2016. They recognize that Trump is very popular with their Republican base, but they also don't want to link themselves too closely with the things that he's said. Female Republicans in particular are in a particularly tricky situation. So if, there, if there's any doubt uh, that issues of gender mattered here, consider this table. Uh, next slide there. Thank you. Um, here we show patterns in who unendorsed Trump as the campaign went on. Some Republican candidates did this early on during the summer and early fall of 2016. These early unendorsers seem to have come out against Trump because their districts were on average less strongly Republican. They calculated that perhaps if they unendorsed Trump, they could maybe win over some moderate or Democratic voters. But after the Pussygate tape was released, more Republicans came out against Trump than had done so at any previous time. Up until that point, there had been nine Republican and House Senate candidates who unendorsed Trump, but after the tapes released, the number of Republican unendorsers leapt up to 35, and many of them were women. Only one Republican female incumbent candidate broke with Trump before the incident, but nine did so afterwards. So these data suggest to us that Trump was expected to lose, and he was expected to lose in part because of his misogynistic comments. This posed a problem for, the, for moderate uh, Republicans and it po posed a particular problem for female uh, Republicans. Unlike the primary election, however, no one could ignore Trump and simply unendorsing him was probably not enough. Democrats, as we'll see in a moment, were going to, tie to tr try to tie their Republican opponents to Trump, regardless of whether this was a fair thing to do or not. Moreover, many of the gender related themes raised in 2016 weren't new. It's not as if previous candidates didn't traffic in gender stereotypes. And there is certainly still room in the campaign to make gender specific appeals. To see how this worked, Valerie's gonna walk you through some of the themes and Senate campaign ads in 2016. Okay, uh, so the centrality of gender and misogyny in the presidential election in 2016 uh, is not typical, and nor is the impact that it had on the congressional races. But one thing we do see is that campaign ads in 2016 definitely played on popular ideas about masculinity and femininity, what we call gender stereotypes or gender norms, um, and that this is not unusual. The companies that are hired to design campaign advertisements and give candidates advice on their campaigns are highly aware of gender norms and they know that they have to help their candidates come across in ways that will appeal to voters without sending the message that the candidate is either doing masculinity or femininity incorrectly. They also know that potential voters are perpetually evaluating candidates in terms of gender norms, even if the voters don't realize they're doing so. So for example, campaign consultants know that if a man is running for office, it's a good idea to show him in an ad with his wife and children because this shows he's a trustworthy, heterosexual, stable man. But by the same token, 
they know that if a woman is running for office and they show her in an ad with her husband and children, they're reinforcing the gender stereotype that says women belong in the home, not in the public sphere. Uh, they also know that both men and women have to come across as tough in order to be successful candidates. But this is trickier for women because if a woman comes across as too tough, then she's gonna rub voters the wrong way as being unfeminine. Uh, men, of course, at a minimum, have to look strong and virile no matter what's going on. Um, so just think back to Boris Yeltsin's presidential campaign in Russia in June of 1996, when he was pictured vigorously dancing away on stage at a rally. The Western campaign consultants who were hired to help him win that election, no doubt knew that he had to prove his physical readiness for re-election given the various instances of his apparent ill health and drunkenness that were publicly witnessed before that time. So for our book, we systematically analyzed all of the campaign ads that we put out, that were put out for the dozen Senate elections that were expected to be competitive in 2016. Um, being especially attentive to explicit and implicit references to gender and gender norms, uh, to masculinity and femininity in these ads. We could give a whole separate talk about that part of the book on the campaign ads, but today we're gonna focus on the ways in which we could see the presidential race and more specifically the gender dynamics of the presidential race affecting the ads in those Senate races. So just to set the scene, the first thing to say is that six of these races had female Democrats running against male Republicans. Um, five had male Democrats running against male Republicans and one in New Hampshire had two women running against each other. We found several patterns in these ads that seemed connected to the presidential race and to Trump's misogyny in particular. First, in what are called attack ads, where the focus is on attacking an opponent, uh, ads for Democrats, especially Democratic women, twice as often as Democratic men, tried to tie their male Republican opponents to Trump. They did this by mentioning Trump in their attack ads, highlighting Trump's sexism, alleging that their Republican male opponents were sexist like Trump and or that they were weak, in other words, unmanly, because they wouldn't stand up to Trump and repudiate him despite his sexism. For instance, an ad by the Deborah Ross campaign in North Carolina took Ross's Republican opponent, Richard Burr, to task for saying, I'm going to support Donald Trump, even after Trump had bragged about sexually assaulting women. Similarly, in Ohio, the Ted Strickland campaign posted an attack ad within a week of the Access Hollywood scandal, where his Republican opponent, Rob Portman, was described as a coward, um, who was, in this case, unsuitable for the Senate because he had been afraid to stand up to Trump and publicly repudiate him, despite Trump's history of degrading women. Now, by the same token, Democratic women running against male Republicans emphasize their own toughness in this regard. Uh, one ad supporting Deborah Ross called her a fighter and pointed out that Deborah Ross isn't afraid of Donald Trump. Meanwhile, uh, Republican men put out ads trying to contrast themselves to Trump and his disregard for women. An ad supporting the Nevada Republican Joe Heck, for example, emphasized that as a doctor, he had cared for thousands of women, including victims of sexual assault and domestic violence, in an effort to show the voters that unlike Trump, Joe Heck deeply cared about women's well-being. In a similar vein, Republican men running against Democratic women subtly tried to draw parallels between their female opponents and Trump by making their female opponents look like they didn't care about women. For example, in Nevada, a Republican political action committee called the Senate Leadership Fund put out three ads criticizing Democrat Catherine Cortez Masto for the slow processing of thousands of backlogged rape kits during her time as Nevada's attorney general. The implication being that even as a woman, she was not sufficiently concerned about identifying and punishing rapists, and also that she was weak on crime in line with the traditional feminine stereotype of weakness generally. Uh, Republican male candidates also tried to make their Democratic male opponents look weak and they frequently did that by tying those opponents to Hillary Clinton in ads. Republican Senate candidates' ads were more than twice as likely to mention Hillary Clinton, negatively, uh, of course, if their Democratic opponent was a man than they were if their Democratic opponent was female. One such ad condemned Democrat Evan Bayh of Indiana for having supported Obamacare, 
and showed him in a celebratory photo with Hillary Clinton. In the same ad uh, by his Republican opponent, Todd Young was described as being the only one with a backbone to stand up against the Clinton-Obama agenda. So we can see here that Trump's misogyny influenced and shaped the content of these Senate campaign ads in a variety of ways. Now, one final thing about the uh, 2016 advertising though that I think is um, of consequence in thinking about 2018 and 2020. There was only one Senate race in 2016 that featured two women uh, running against each other. In that race in New Hampshire, the gender cues were strikingly different. Uh, this was a particularly brutal race and the Democrat, Maggie Hassan, was the subject of a series of attack ads criticizing her for some of her husband's uh, professional problems. In the same way that uh, Geraldine Ferraro was attacked uh, during her 1984 vice presidential campaign for her husband's uh, business problems. The two women running in New Hampshire also, however, played up a sort of femininity that wasn't present elsewhere. Hassan talked frankly about her challenges as the parent of a special needs child, and the Republican incumbent in the race, Kelly Iote, ran a number of ads such as this one that you see here, where she appeared with her mother and her daughter. She's also the only candidate I know of who ran an ad where she was hiking with her daughter and a baby carrier. Iote had a much more difficult time than any other Republican in 2016, however, in fending off questions about Donald Trump. Time and again, she found herself being called upon to respond to the latest misogynistic comment that he had made. It was as if because she's a woman, she was expected to hold Trump to a higher standard than a man would. Iote narrowed early lost, and she may well have lost because of these difficulties. It's hard to generalize from this one race, but it does say, suggest a few things about elections since Trump. Trump's win in the 2016 presidential elections had an impact on the 2018 midterms. One place where we can see this is in the absolutely unprecedented number of women who decided to run for political office in 2018. In the first four months of 2017, EMILY's List, an organization that supports pro-choice Democratic women who run for office, was contacted by more than 11,000 women interested in running for political positions, from school boards to the House of Representatives, a vast increase from the approximately 900 women who voiced uh, interest in running during the 2016 election cycle, according to the group. And 476 women actually filed to run for the House in 2018, twice as many as had done so two years earlier. And the number of female candidates running for the Senate in 2018, which was 53, easily beat the previous high of 40 in 2016. While these numbers aren't necessarily the direct result of Trump's electoral college victory, uh, Kelly Dittmar, a political scientist who studies gender and political campaigns, was confident that it was the, quote, misogyny in Trump's rhetoric and behavior that had pushed women over the edge to not just thinking about running, but to put their names out there. Despite the historically high number of women in the House currently, the number of Republican women in the House dropped from 22 in 2016 to 13 in 2018. And two of the more consequential uh, Republican women in the House are retiring in 2020. This has been a subject of, of uh, concern for some of the remaining Republican women in the House, women who have tried to keep their distance from Trump, uh, such as Wyoming Representative Liz Cheney, have been sharply criticized by their male colleagues and threatened with uh, being stripped of their leadership positions, uh, something that I don't think would happen to a male representative uh, should he have said the same sort of things. On the other hand, New York Representative Elise Stefanik has sought to present herself both as an advocate for greater women's representation within the party and as a staunch Trump supporter. Stefanik's efforts to recruit women have in fact uh, yielded a record high number of female Republican candidates this year. I think is the case that uh, the vast majority of these candidates are likely to lose, but it still is, in my opinion, one of the most uh, underreported uh, things happening in the Republican party in 2020 that so many more women are running. Um, these are not necessarily typical of the kind of Republican women that ran in the past. Indeed, many of these are uh, QAnon supporters, including some who appear likely to win their seats. Um, the Senate, however, is a different story. There are currently nine Republican women in the Senate two of whom won their seats after 2016. It'll be interesting to watch the gender dynamics of some of the 2020 races. There are only about seven or eight Senate races that the handicappers have ranked as toss-ups, or at least uh, ranked as toss-ups for this week, um, uh, or leaning in one direction in 2020. Four of these, however, so more than half of them, feature female Republican incumbents, 
Arizona, where recently appointed Senator Martha McSally is running against uh, former astronaut Mark Kelly, uh, the husband of former Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords. And Maine, where Senator Susan Collins is facing the female speaker of the Maine House of Representatives. Uh, Georgia, where recently appointed Senator Kelly Loeffler faces several opponents in a multi-candidate special election. And another race between two women uh, being held in Iowa between Senator Joni Ernst and political newcomer Teresa Greenfield. You can see in the media coverage of these races uh, something similar to 2016. Collins, I think, has been held to account for her support for Trump and her, for her Brett for Kavanaugh, vote for uh, Brett Kavanaugh uh, for the Supreme Court in ways that I don't think a male Republican would be. So one ironic consequence of Trump's 2016 victory is that female Republican members of Congress are put at a particular disadvantage. Uh, McSally, Loeffler, and Ernst have also gotten particularly harsh news coverage for their support for Trump, coverage that I don't know that men in similar kinds of places are getting. So the number of Republican women in the Senate could be cut nearly in half this year. There are, in addition, three long-shot Democratic challenges in Kentucky, Texas, and South Carolina that have yielded lots of money nationally from liberal donors are likely an outgrowth of some of the Democratic enthusiasm and Trump backlash of 2018, and two of which feature women who ran high-profile but unsuccessful House races in that year. There are six women who ran for the Democratic presidential nomination in 2020. It's hard to say that any of them came up short because uh, they're women, but it's also not possible to prove that Hillary Clinton lost in 2016 because she's a woman. Until a woman is elected president, this perception will be a problem for women running for president in a way that it's simply not for women seeking other offices. It also seems evident the Democratic men's association with uh, Democratic women has been used against them uh, so far in 2020. The central role that Kamala Harris Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, and Ayanna Presley have played in advertisements against Joe Biden and in some cases against men running for other offices, suggests that these women may be used or being used in the same way that Hillary Clinton and before her Nancy Pelosi were used against male Democrats. A final lesson from our book, however, is something that I think hasn't gotten much attention. Despite the difficulties that Republicans had from in escaping the shadow of the presidential race in 2016, we've documented in our book that there was a very thorough effort in 2016 by Republican super PAC donors and by the party committees to insulate Republicans in the House and in particular in the Senate <clears throat> from the more harmful rhetoric of the Trump campaign. This effort may well have made the difference for a number of candidates. They were able to spend what it took to win on their own and to avoid being linked too closely to Trump. Many of them, in fact, ran well ahead of Trump in their states. This wasn't possible in 2018, and the polling data we have suggests that it is even less possible in 2020. Indeed, most Republican congressional candidates in competitive races are running behind Trump in their states or districts, and many of the Senate races that are competitive this year are probably competitive because the presidential race is uh, dragging down the Republican incumbents there. No matter how Trump fares in this election, Republicans are facing a paradox. They can't seem to find a way to break with him, yet support for him clearly costs them votes. Now, we're not gonna tell you here necessarily whether this is a positive thing or not, uh, but I think the main lesson going forward is this. Everyone, Democrats and Republicans, campaigned in 2016 as if Trump was a loser, and furthermore, as if he was a loser because of many of the things that he said about sex and race. While well, American political candidates have a long history of using sexual and racial cues in elections, they tend to do so in a far more subtle way than Trump did. There's been little evidence since 2016 that it was wise for anyone to calculatedly offend in that way to emulate Trump. And I think we shouldn't assume that it's a strategy that is going to work particularly well for Trump or other Republicans in 2020 either. Okay. And that is our talk. Uh, this was a great, these are great observations, a great talk, uh, very timely. Uh, and we have a number of questions. The first question uh, from the audience, uh, did the misogyny and homophobia simply become emboldened and more open under Trump's America and Putin's Russia? Or ha was it 
uh, has it simply increased and worsened? And if it has increased, why? Should I take a stab at that, Rob? Sure. Okay. So I think I think that's a good question. Um, my suspicion, at least in the you know in in the Russian case, is that it um, is that it became more more open. Um, I think in the U.S. case, my feeling is that it worsened um, because of Donald Trump's personality. He really seemed to have opened the door. Uh, you know, and, and if if we were going to talk about racism, I would say that it became more open. Um, but with sexism, I feel like it. I feel like it got worse. On the other hand, um, in some ways, the getting worse that that Donald Trump uh, produced. Um, I think it had sort of a positive effect. The Me Too movement in the United States anyway, I think was in many ways uh, inspired and encouraged by the fact that somebody with Trump's record of you know, sexually harassing and assaulting women was able to get into the White House. So I feel like it, it, may, it may seem like it's um, gotten worse. Uh, and if it has, I think I would you know, I, I think I would say that we can credit uh, Donald Trump with that, but it's certainly become more open as a result of um, of that 2016 presidential campaign, I would say. I think it depends a little bit on what do you mean about, uh, you know, it becoming open or worse. Um, the, uh, the John Sides, uh, Lynn Babrak, Michael Tesler book on the 2016 election argues that Trump had what they call a reverse Midas touch. That is the American public in public opinion surveys swung against pretty much everything that Trump did. So American overall, when you look at surveys, Americans views on matters of uh, racial equality, on matters of gender equality and so on, have actually moved away from Trump uh, since 2016. So in one measure, uh, things have gotten better. But I think what Trump showed is that politicians can get away with very visible efforts to offend, right? The whole shock jock mentality that uh, Trump uh, capitalized upon. So I think by for Trump to show that politicians can uh, command attention by transgressing, by saying things that other politicians won't, uh, he has perhaps inspired others to try that. But again, a part of our point in our book is that we didn't see politicians being successful in that, right? We've seen a lot of politicians who tried to be Trump, who tried to say outrageous things, but most of them are, uh, you know, I don't know what word you want to use, right? They're less effective in, in doing that. I, I thought I, ha I actually, I realized I didn't respond to the homophobic part of the, not the homophobic part of the question, but the part of the question that was about homophobia, certainly in Russia, that's gotten worse, um, right? We've seen laws passed, um, you know, in the Russian context now outlawing quote unquote homosexual propaganda in front of minors. And, and that, you know, that obviously is part of the more conservative turn um, under, under Putin. Um, attitudes in Russia were getting more and more tolerant in terms of, um, uh, in terms of LGBT uh, people, um, so less and less homophobic after the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, but then have uh, re-escalated after like 2012. So that is getting worse. Any other comments on this question? I have another one then. Uh, some, uh, you focused in this presentation on attack ads but did you see similar trends around gender in ads that are not attacking the opposition, but instead promoting the candidate's position? Mm -hmm. So more positive um, ads. That's a good question. Um, well, uh, the easy answer is that elections tend to be dominated by attack ads. So <laughs> positive ads are not common in uh, competitive races. Um, one other, uh, one other way to think about this is that advertisements in elections also follow a relatively predictable sequence. That is at the beginning of a campaign before things get kind of heated, candidates will seek to introduce themselves in a sort of relatively positive way. They will start seek to talk about their, their issue views, their platform, and then once the election really gets going, they'll start going after their opponent. So there was much less discussion of Trump and Clinton 
early on in the race, in part because candidates were trying to establish themselves, but in part because the, the public was focused a little bit less on Trump and Clinton. So it's hard to say how that plays out in terms of, uh, in terms of gender. Uh, most of our efforts to measure gender had to do with how we felt uh, the presidential race was being used either directly by showing pictures of Hillary Clinton or kind of indirectly by playing on gender related themes. And that doesn't happen early in the campaign, but again, it's hard to separate out whether that's because of candidates thoughts about gender or because the presidential race is more fluid at that point. I think one of the things we, we did see, especially in the campaign ads um, for in favor of and for uh, female candidates was that they they really tried hard to balance uh, femininity with toughness. So if there is an ad about, um, you know, if there's a, an ad for a female candidate who is a prosecutor, she might be shown in sort of a, a softer color or a pink um, or, or something like that to emphasize that, you know, don't worry, she actually, you know, she's still a woman. Um, and, you know, and still, you know, she's, she's tough on crime, but not threatening, you know, to, to men in general. So we, we certainly saw the reinforcement of those kinds of, uh, of those kinds of things. Women with military backgrounds, that was particularly common, right? You'd see them in their military gear and then towards the end of the ad, they'd show up with their husband and kids. Right, right, often with a baby. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Uh, here's another question. Are the problematic behaviors by Putin Trump simply uh, tactics to appeal to misogynist homophobic voters or are the problematic behaviors causing voters to embrace these ideals. Yeah. Well, I can say a little, I can say a little about that. I think to some extent it's tactical. Um, it's certainly tactical on the part of campaign advertisers, something that really surprised me when we began this project, because I never studied the United States. Um, you know, my focus was always on, on Russia, it was just how well the campaign advertisers understood uh, gender norms and the importance of, um, you know, and the importance of sort of playing on gender norms, but also being careful uh, to balance um, men's and women's uh, gender norms as portrayed in these ads. Um, I, so I think, I think the I think the appearance of sexism and homophobia, whether it's in advertising or in things that the candidates say, I think that it's almost like a lowest common denominator tactic. You know, when I when I think about Elizabeth Warren, you know, referring to Trump and Pence as these weak, small, insecure men, you know, Elizabeth Warren would call herself, and I think does call herself a feminist, and yet she's using you know, misogyny as, or, or she's trying to undermine, uh, you know, the masculinity of her opponents by, you know, by using what is sort of a misogynist and homophobic tactic. So, so I, I think that it is, I think it is tactical. I think in some cases it's almost unconscious. Um, you know, I guess that's, that's what I, that's what I would say. And like when, when you go to the women's march and you see people holding signs that say, you know, Trump is Putin's bitch, you know, they're not trying to say, they're not trying to convince anyone that Trump is gay, um, but they are still drawing on a homophobic stereotype. Here's another question. Is there research on whether these aggressive tactics convince more voters to turn out? or do they simply cause voters to disengage? Uh, I guess that's uh, that one, I guess is for me. Um, uh, there are ways of turning out the base, right? So they were certainly effective for Trump in the, uh, in the primary, uh, in part because it distinguished him from other candidates. And in part, uh, you know, we, we tend not to, uh, you know, it, it's hard to think back to how we approached the presidential race in 2016, right? So much has happened since then. But uh, Trump managed to combine this kind of pugnacious, willing to offend style with a message that really resonated among working class Republican voters on trade, on other things, where he was much more in step, I think, with Republican voters than Republican elites were. So it's kind of hard to disentangle the two, right? That was part of the package uh, for Trump. 
in general, most of the evidence we have suggests that the more you distinguish yourself, the better you are at turning out your base supporters. So that's something that's been done by candidates in primaries. General elections, we, we just don't have anything other than 2016 in the US to really compare this to. That is, Trump went so far beyond the norms of what presidential candidates do that it's difficult to figure out what aspects of his rhetorical strategy may have inspired people to show up versus stay at home as compared to other aspects of his strategy, right? The deliberate attempts to uh, suppress democratic turnout, for instance, other sorts of features of that race. Yeah, I think, I think those are really good points. And just somewhat tangentially to this, the latest issue of um, the journal um, Gender and Politics has a section on turnout and, um, and, and gender. And one of the findings in, uh, in that section was that uh, when there's a woman in the race, it increases turnout. Uh, and I, I suspect that's just because it's a little more interesting. Um, whether that's also, you know, true of when there's misogyny in the race, I, I, I don't, I don't think we have a study on, as Rob said, on, on that quite yet. Another question: How do these attack ads play in urban, suburban, and rural areas? Any noticeable dif any notable differences in audience receptivity? Uh, TV ads are really kind of. Uh, cookie cutter things. Uh, the, the ads that we focused on were, uh, were again geared towards television. So the, uh, for one thing, they didn't necessarily run in uh, places that were overwhelmingly of one party or the other. Uh, but to think about them in other ways, uh, they were not designed to, they were designed to sort of stay in bounds, right? To not say anything that would deliberate, that would go too far in offending any particular voting demographic. Uh, now we've missed certainly a number of ads, right? Ads that are targeted very narrowly on social media, for instance, or in other ways of reaching a much more uh, select demographic may go a lot further in uh, how they portray uh, Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. That's right. There was that, um, there was that social media ad put out by, um, what was it, Ted Cruz supporters, right? In, in, in Utah, I think, during the, uh, during the primary where they showed, it was like, um, I think they had a photograph from a GQ uh, photo shoot in the year 2000 of Melania Trump sort of lying on some sort of fur rug, oh, yeah. basically naked. And, and the, the text that went along with it said, um, this could be your next first lady or you could vote for Ted Cruz on Tuesday, you know, with the implication being uh, that if you, you know, if you end up, like you shouldn't vote for Donald Trump because his wife is a slut, you know, so like you get this use of, um, you know, of femininity playing into, you know, that sort of ad, you know, the idea that you could, um, you could sort of insult a man by insulting his, his wife, or if, if his wife is, you know, cheap or insufficiently or improperly feminine, then that reflects badly on the man. And that was like targeted incredibly precisely, right? To Mormon voters, like probably Mormon female voters in Utah. So you do get a much more precise targeting um, in social media ads, I guess, than is really possible with TV. Yeah, it's important to note though, that uh, one of the fortuitous things about our book is we showed up in what could have been the last election where it was easy to find an archive of television advertising. I think since then, it's become apparent that as advertising goes online, for one thing, it's very hard to figure out uh, whether a particular advertisement is a strategic concoction of people who know what they're doing versus you know, <laughs> some random group of people with a video camera, and it's also very hard to just find all of these things in one place. So I think it'll be very difficult for anybody going forward to really think through ads and the sort of, to make any effort to be comprehensive and, or systematic like we did, just because there's, there's so much out there of varying quality, varying levels of strategy, and uh, we often don't know when we as academics find these things, who the actual target is anymore. Here's another question. Have you observed any effective ways to reduce the impact 
and decrease the use of sexism, homophobia, and ideals of masculinity in political campaigns and political rhetoric. Uh, well, uh, you know, again, um, we have some survey evidence that the American people are becoming less open to such things. If that's the case, then those ads won't work, right? An ad that plays upon racial stereotypes is only going to work if the audience picks up on those racial stereotypes. There will always be some people that do that, but... I think some of these things will will vary. I, I, I have not seen research on this, perhaps Valerie has, but my sense is that it will become very, it will become much more difficult to use homophobic themes and advertisements going forward simply because they resonate less with the American people. If you think back to the 1990s, it was fairly common in both parties to put together these advertisements that didn't call the opponent gay, but made say a, a man of the other party look like he might be, like look effeminate. There was a famous ad that the uh, Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee put together in the late 1990s in the state of Montana, where they made a big production out of the fact that the Republicans candidate had at one time attended hairdressing school, right? And the implication there was perhaps he's not straight. Um, I don't think we see those ads anymore, right? I think the American people have evolved to the point that uh, they're, they're unhappy about such things. And maybe it's possible that's a naive view, but I think that's the, the one thing we can say about making such ads less common is make the public <laughs> you know, more, more tolerant of such things. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would agree. I mean, I think the best antidote <laughs> to sexism and homophobia, whether in advertisements or, you know, or anywhere else is a strong feminist movement and a strong LGBTQ uh, plus, et cetera, um, movement. I think that that's what, that's what works over time, right? Is that people would no longer be charmed um, and find entertaining something like that. Instead, they would uh, instead they would react against it. Now that said, that said, um, it was not but a few weeks ago that the Lincoln Project put out that ad um, about, well, they've put out a number of ads about Trump sort of playing on his, uh, you know, his ostensible weakness and manliness. Um, and one of those ads ends by saying, um, vote for Joe Biden. He's not a whiny bitch. Now, if you ask me, like that plays on some, you know, that plays on some sexism. Uh, so I think that as, you know, it may, what it might be is that it might be increasingly less possible to use sexism against women, but it would not be increasingly unlikely to use, you know, to use the gender norm of masculinity as a political weapon or as a political tool. Here's another question. Uh, is there a drastic difference in attack ads use of prejudices based on where the ad is shown? Are they more effective in certain areas? as opposed to others versus others? Uh, sure, this is all data that, uh, you know, is relatively proprietary, but certainly an ad will play differently in uh, a part of the country where people have different attitudes on, on race. Um, the, that doesn't necessarily mean that the parties or interest groups running these ads will have access to that information. Every election cycle, there will be some instance where a super PAC puts together an advertisement or one of the party campaign committees puts together an advertisement and the candidate in that race will kind of publicly say, oh, you, know, you shouldn't be writing that, that advertisement here. It doesn't fit with my campaign or that ads will play on various kinds of stereotypes that candidates don't necessarily want to pursue. Now, that doesn't mean that candidates are sincere in saying that, right? The point for many of the ads that we showed, these are ads put together by the Democratic Senatorial Committee, the uh, National Republican Senatorial Campaign Committee, uh, or the party allied super PACs. They're designed to be separate from candidates so that candidates can say, I don't have anything to do with that, right? I don't endorse that message. I don't know what uh, that advertisement is talking about. Uh, so that doesn't mean that candidates are sincere in saying that. 
But I think the party campaign committees have tried to calibrate their ads somewhat based on based on who lives in the state, based on the characteristics of that media market. And again, all of this will change as as advertisements move online, it will be easier to find ways to play on people's political attitudes, whether they're attitudes having to do with race or you know things that we might find problematic or not. It'll be easier to segment your audience in that way and give them very narrowly focused ads and worry a little bit less that the content of that ad will become a matter of public discussion or will even be known by people who might be bothered by it. Valerie, do you want to uh, add anything or? No. Do we have time for one more question? Well, I, uh, we don't have any more audience questions, but I have two questions. Oh, great. Uh, one of them is uh, you've talked about uh, US elections and you've talked about uh, Putin and Russian elections, but you haven't really talked about the hot topic of Russian interference in the 20, or at least uh, the 2016 election. And particularly in terms of social media, uh, which as Rob has mentioned, uh, is becoming much more significant. Uh, can you talk a little bit about whether you think, uh, what you think about all the accusations about Russian interference in the 2016 election? Did you and your research find uh, evidence for that and what you think, um, how that may or may not have influenced the 2016 election? I, I could say a little about that. We, we really did not touch on that at all uh, in the book. It wasn't what we were, um, wasn't what we were um, looking at, but I think Kathleen Hall Jameson in, in her book really um, does a, a great job, you know, of getting down into the the details of just, you know, speaking of targeted ads, right? Um, you know, they the the in, the intervention, the interference um, that did occur. I think they were really able to target their um, their messaging to particular communities. You know, whether it was to tell African Americans to stay home, you know, that they didn't need to vote, uh, or um, or whether it was efforts to, you know, promote divisiveness in uh, in particular communities, I, th I think they were they were very specific and very targeted, and they had a lot of really detailed um, information to go on when they were trying to foment uh, divisiveness and make democracy look like, you know, like a failed system. Rob, do you have anything on that? Yeah, I, I mean, again, it was something, you know, when we were putting together this project, it didn't occur to us that the Russians might be involved in the election. Um, I am, I don't know what to make in the end of Jameson's argument. I think she, she does a very convincing job of showing that the Russian, you know, the, the Rus Russians who were engaged in trying to put disinformation out on Facebook were incredibly smart, right? The things they did were things that somebody who had a PhD in political science and had spent years and years studying how to manipulate voters would do, right? Mm -hmm. So they did very smart things, but there were plenty of people who were not Russians who are equally smart, who were also involved in that election, who were also trying to do similar sorts of things. So we don't really know what the consequence was. It's hard to separate out the efforts of Russians from groups like Cambridge Analytica that were also trying to sort of push the envelope in terms of how they could demobilize voters. Um, you know, so we don't know what the contribution of each of these actors was. And I think, you know, I, I think we never will, but I think, uh, the, the message that we've gotten over the past week or so from our president is that whatever they were trying to do, Donald Trump is gonna do much more, over, is trying to do much more overtly <laughs> this year, right? So right now Trump is a bigger, you know, the Times headline, right? Trump's a bigger threat to democracy than anything else, I think kind of, kind of sums up where we're at, right? There, everybody else has an interest in our elections, but we're, we're capable of making them awful all by ourselves, just fine. <laughs> on that note <laughs> <laughs> yes we see it thank you both uh, we seem to have come to the end of our time um, for this program I want to urge people 
uh, to check out the Facebook site uh, for the Gender Socialism and Post-Socialism Workshop. Uh, check out also the uh, book, Trumping Politics as Usual, Masculinity, Misogyny, and the 2016 Elections by Valerie Sperling and Rob Boatwright. I think that you have uh, really helped us enormously in bringing attention to the centrality of issues of gender and misogyny in the 2016 US elections and of course made us much more conscious of what will be happening in 2020. I mean, I just remember in terms of gender stereotypes going back to Michael Dukakis and his tank and uh, the fact that a draft dodger and a deserter could uh, feminize two Vietnam War vets with uh, Gore and Kerry. These are themes that have been, go uh, have been part of our elections for some time and the fact that you've brought them out into consciousness uh, is very, very important in terms of people being able to recognize these issues and also being somewhat um, defended against them. So thank you both very, very much for this great talk. <laughs>